everybody and welcome back to my channel. I am Jen and this is Fundy Fridays and here on my channel I talk about different aspects of Christian fundamentalism while always serving the best face. So before we get any further this top is from Hell Bunny and they are a British company. I only know that because I ordered a pair of pants in size 3x and you know what, I wouldn't even have generously called that a medium. Second of all, if you are having a little bit of deja vu about today's episode topic, you're not going crazy. This is one that I've done thrice now. The first time was just little old me talking in my living room. The second time I had James come in and explain accreditation more and now this time I'm just gonna full-blown just fucking read the whole damn thing. Today's episode is about various sketchy Christian colleges. That's really all I got to say about it other than the fact that James did write a significant portion of today's script. If you aren't aware I'm a proud college dropout. <laughs> Maybe not proud. Uh, that's why I had to bring in James to help me with a few parts such as the bits on accreditation because quite frankly it's very confusing because there isn't just one body of accreditation and some hold more weight than others, some are more concerned with academics where others are just kind of like a rubber stamp to get you through a diploma mill. I know, controversial, but that is what I am bringing him in for. So when it comes to accreditation, a secular college or one of these Christian ones we're talking about, it's a system of accountability. At least that's what it's supposed to be about. Accreditation organizations exist to ensure that each member organization meets at least a minimum standard of competency, effectiveness, and ethical action, and that an education from the institution is of benefit to the students involved as they graduate and pursue employment. But pretty soon after even the first ones were established, people learned that really anyone can start an accreditation board. With just a little investment in a fancy letterhead and a web address, you too can decide which schools get to appear like they're a good investment for students' time and money, even when they totally aren't. And you bet your ass I'm going to remember that when it comes time for me to be the dean of Limbiscuit University. But this system is how we get organizations like the Transnational Association of Christian Colleges and Schools, or TRACS. And while this organization might sound cool because it has trans in the name, it is, <laughs> it is definitely not, it is definitely not that. TRACS spent years acting as a rubber stamp to ensure that Christian colleges weren't truly being held to the same standard as their secular counterparts. And bear in mind, if you're looking to enroll into college right now, make sure that you ensure your school is regionally accredited. Regional accreditation is the only true and consistent standard for U.S. colleges and universities. Ask the recruiters about it, and if they avoid the question, go ahead and save your application fee for a better, more honest school. Before we get into the big three, as I'm going to probably never refer to them again as, we have some dishonorable mentions here. Most of these schools have some things in common, such as their draconian rules for adult paying students, dress codes, rules against what you can watch in your own dorm. I got tagged in a few TikToks where a Liberty student got fined for watching The Hangover. So just things like that. Some have updated their rules, but it used to be like, you know, students would be separated by gender in the hallways and they couldn't take the same elevators as each other. I know a lot of these Christian schools have such hardcore purity rules that if you're not married, like you're not even allowed to go stay the night with your, with your boyfriend or girlfriend. How they know? Well, a lot of them rely on an intricate system of snitches, quite frankly. But yes, there are a lot of rules at these places that you wouldn't see at say a secular college. They just control them in the most minute ways, which really gives a false sense of security and safety for students and their parents alike because these schools are rampant with sexual abuse. The first school on our on our dishonorable mentions list is Patrick Henry College, which is in Purcellville, Virginia. And one of the notable people who graduated from this school would be Madison Cawthorn. Go check out James's video on him. He's a very interesting person. Patrick Henry College also has a problem with sex abuse, so let me read that to you. A story published by the New Republic detailed allegations of mishandled sexual abuse cases at Patrick Henry College, aka God's Harvard, including one instance in which a dean told a student who had been sexually assaulted in her sleep that if she were telling the truth, God would have kept her conscience to bear witness to the abuse. On Facebook and Christian blogs, people like Samantha Field have attested to getting similarly fucked up abuse counseling at other fundamentalist churches and Christian colleges around the country. 
And I will be honest with you, I didn't do too much more research on Patrick Henry, so if there's other glaring, um, horrible scandals, you'll have to fill me in in the comments. The next one is Crown College of the Bible in Knoxville, Tennessee, and that school is lovingly known as Clown College in Fundy Snark Circles, and um, it's known for having an anti-interracial dating policy that lasted uh, quite a long time. <laughs> um, they don't have it anymore, but never forget. The other thing that this school is known for is being the uh, school that the Bates children go to. Uh, I guess they're adults now. Um, yes, that's right. The boys and girls of the Bates family are allowed to seek secondary education as long as it is a fundamentalist college. All right, guys, there was something I found about Crown College while I was editing, and that is that the president of the college offered to house all of the torn down K KKK um, statues and Confederate statues around the country and like housed them in a little uh, like victory garden at the school and people did not like that. So here's a news clip about it. Robin Crown College says their mission is to teach students the scripture and the value of their Christian heritage. Their founder says part of that is teaching what he says is the full picture of America. On 200 acres and pals, Speaking to us from his Hall of Presidents, featuring every Commander-in-Chief from Washington to Trump. We believe that having the whole of the history is what we need. Crown College founder Dr. Clarence Sexton wants to make a home for statues pulled down across the country. Local advocates say displaying those statues would represent hatred instead of history. And we know it took all these things to make America what it is today, and somewhere all these parts need to be displayed. He'd put it on an undeveloped part of the college's land next to the cemetery used in the Civil War. You know, he said, look, if these people are taking these statues down, why don't we bring all those, all those statues here? We'll, we'll put them out, give them historical perspective. Dr. Sexton thinks it should extend to all historical figures, including Nathan Bedford Forrest, the first Grand Wizard of the KKK and an enslaver of black Americans. Cruz took that statue down from the state capitol earlier this year. Forrest is a part of American history. If there's something that is dark and ugly about what they did, then those things should be pointed out. Dr. Sexton says it's to create a full picture of American history. So we reached out to the NAACP to get their thoughts on the plan. They haven't responded yet to our request. Meanwhile, in Campbell County, commissioners voted to create a statue museum with statues from presidents and other controversial leaders from the past. After community outrage, the commissioners asked the county mayor to veto the resolution. They plan to retract it at their next meeting in January. Now, Mayor E.L. Morton tells me if they don't retract it, he will veto it, Robin. The next one I would like to dunk on is Oral Roberts University, named after the iconic traveling evangelist of the 20th century, Oral Roberts. I used to only know one thing about this school, and it's the giant praying hands, which, I don't know, seems a little off to me, but I can't quite put my fist on it. This thing, child's play. This is nothing, this is a popsicle stick. This is intermediate. People do this? Yes, they do. Oral Roberts does have some financial scandals under their belt, but it really pales in comparison to the story that James dug up, and it is fucking crazy. See, Oral Roberts University and its familial leadership were at the center of a massive controversy throughout the year of 2007. Oh, 2007. It was a different time. Happy Bunny, My Chemical Romance, jeans that went all the way down to your vulva, ring back tones, and bod chocolate man spray. Anyways, what was I talking about? Oral Roberts. It began around 2005 when then President Richard Roberts pressured three Oral Roberts professors to use school materials and student labor towards a local mayoral campaign, which they did. But when the IRS started looking at how a nonprofit entity was giving such lavish contributions, one professor was directed to take the blame. Meanwhile, Roberts' sister in law, Stephanie Cantice, prepared an unrelated internal memo referred to as Scandal Vulnerability Assessment. Essentially, this document 
it was a categorized list of the Roberts family's various misdeeds and sins. Certainly not the kind of thing you would want an unassuming student to have access to, right? Anyway, Cantice would later go on to give her laptop with this uh, list of all these terrible things that was going on to an unassuming student to make repairs. Unfortunately for the Roberts family, this student just so happened to also be close with the professor who had been asked to take the blame for the IRS thing. They just so also happened to find the scandal assessment during the repair and turned the document over to the professor. Then in what appears to be an act of retaliation for being turned into a patsy, professor number one turned the document over to Oral Roberts Board of Regents, prompting an ethics violation into the Roberts family. This led not only to his termination, but the termination of his wife and another professor. Naturally, these three would move to file a wrongful termination lawsuit, which had the hilarious unintended consequence of introducing the scandal assessment into the court record for all to see. This allowed for us to see the blatant misappropriation of university funds for the Roberts' personal use, including their clothes, their stable of horses, and a trip to the Bahamas for Richard's daughter that was billed as a missionary expense. But all that pales in comparison to the reported behavior of Richard's wife, Lindsay. And in the assessment, there were very graphic details of her impropriety towards underage boys. Lindsay was reported to be texting certain boys past midnight on university phones. I also want to note that she was caught on security camera with these boys over 80 times, and there was even footage of her in a car alone with them many times. The lawsuit was filed in 2007, and the last article that mentions it all seems to be from early 2008, indicating there was likely a settlement in order to remove this from the public eye ASAP. I'm honestly upset that it wasn't a bigger story than it was and that everyone just kind of let it go. I mean, this is huge. What age were these boys? You keep saying underage boys. How old were they? Uh, they were teenage. Teenage? Under 18? Under 18. Under 18? Yeah, they were high Are you kidding me? They were high schoolers. Why isn't she in prison? That's a great question, isn't it? I think I'm going to keep this in. <laughs> yeah, they're fucking high school. High school! What the fuck? High school. High okay. school. That puts a whole other st uh, sting to it. Nice boobs, by the way. Anyway, on to the next one. Brigham Young University out of Provo, Utah. Um, all I'm going to say is, you know what you fucking did. Shine on, you crazy Mormons. The next school that we're going to talk about is Pensacola Christian College, which is in Pensacola. Florida. This school was founded by Arlen and Becca Horton. Wait, is a Becca named after Becca Horton? That's, that's cute. I'll, I'll give them that. And these people graduated from Bob Jones University in 1951, and then they moved to Pensacola, Florida to found their school. And it started out as Pensacola Christian Grade School, which opened in 1954, and then it was later named Pensacola Christian Academy, which is still open today. In 1974, the Hortons opened Pensacola Christian College to further their vision of education from a Christian perspective, which, you know, we have a shortage of. The college had 100 students its first year open and was based in a single building, Ballard Hall. Pensacola Theological Seminary, an extension of PCC's graduate school, was founded in 1998. Its avowed purpose is to fill each student's mind and heart with what the Bible says. Arlen retired in 2012 and then... Yeah, uh, it's now led by Mr. Shoemaker, a former administrator at Pensacola Christian Academy. The college markets its education programs as being specifically intended to prepare educators for employment at Christian schools rather than public schools, though graduates of the programs have been eligible to apply for public school teacher certification in Florida since 2000. Well... Thank God for that. Because the college accepts a literal interpretation of the Genesis creation narrative from the Bible and rejects evolution and other mainstream theories about the origins of the age of the earth, students are taught young earth creationism and that God created the earth in six literal 24-hour days. PCC's biology classes are based on creationism. Since 2013, Pensacola has been accredited by TRAX, a religious national accreditation agency recognized by the U.S. Department of Education to offer associates to doctorate degrees. Because they 
do not participate in federal student aid programs. They are not required to contribute to the U.S. Department of Education's National Database of Alleged Criminal Offenses reported to post-secondary institutions, campus security and authorities, or local law enforcement agencies. The school is also not bound by the Clery Act, a federal law that requires colleges and universities to keep records and disclose crimes committed on campus. Any policy on those issues would be up to the school. So they don't have to report on sex crimes, which is one of the big reasons why it's not safe to go to these schools. Some famous alumni from uh, Pensacola Christian College would be Kent Hovind, a famed young earth creationist, tax evader, and domestic abuser. And I promise I will put out a Kent Hovind episode soon because he is fascinating. And although Matt Gates did not attend PCC, he did go there to butter them up and presumably get votes. PCC also has a special role and a special contribution that it makes to our office. I was calculating on my drive over that uh, about 20% of my staff and workforce are PCC affiliated, PCC <laughs> graduates. And uh, that's not by accident. Another notable thing about PCC is that they have a legitimate, like, water park um, on their campus and it looks fucking awesome and you know what they've completely changed my mind i can see why people want to go here i want to go on that slide the other big thing that pcc is known for is their abeka homeschooling curriculum which i'm so glad that they offer both accredited and unaccredited for all your needs our family loves to travel and for us, it was really difficult being in a traditional school and still getting the experience we wanted. And so we decided that we would homeschool so that we could show our kids the world. When we transitioned into homeschool, I didn't want to lose the title of mom. That was really important to me. And so we have found a way to balance using a Becca. For our family, it's really important that we're using a faith-based curriculum. We want to know exactly what content they're looking at and feel comforted if we even haven't previewed it first, that it's something that's appropriate and that is gonna be in line with our beliefs. It's just the right amount that makes us feel really good as parents that we're exposing our kids to that. I also want to shout out Ellie from Ex Fundy Diaries. I just got done watching their episode about their experience with Abeka homeschooling and it was brutal. Um, I highly recommend their channel. They're very insightful, super sweet, funny too. Um, and they talk all about um, just the loneliness and isolation and educational neglect that they experienced through this fundamentalist Christian nationalist curriculum. I went ahead and went on the Abeka website and dug through their sample lessons. They really have a wide variety of topics. You know, they got you Bible stuff, which I expected, but also phonics for little kids. Class stand. Oh, I love when we're being so attentive. Aw, as a ostrich, O says aw, aw, aw. Maybe that wasn't a good example. They have a lovely home economics class. Now, the important step here is cutting in the fat. And in this case, I'm using butter. I don't want anything with trans fats. I try to stay away from that if at all possible. And you'll notice... Um, we should move on to the next topic, which would be sexual abuse scandals at Pensacola. <laughs> Who would have thought? People had been enduring sexual abuse at Pensacola for a long time, and they had been being punished for it at any time they came forward, which, of course, created an environment where nobody wanted to speak up. And, I mean, shit, you know how it is when you report a fucking sex crime. They might as well take your report and put it in the fucking shredder. So, I can't imagine uh, what these people went through, but a viral blog post kind of ripped through the... Um, world of Pensacola and other fundamentalist colleges like it, the blog post had a bunch of examples of people who had been assaulted quite brutally at Pensacola and when they spoke up about it, they were shamed, they were told that it was their fault, you know, what were you wearing, blah blah blah, all that kind of stuff. And Pensacola did respond, but it was very half-assed. They're like, we always report crimes. Yeah, no you don't. The blog post is quite informative, but it is very graphic, so just be careful if you want to check it out. Um, yes, yeah, so people were allegedly expelled and harassed and just treated like crap um, at these schools for having the audacity to report 
horrible crimes that happened to them. And this was happening to all genders and orientations. So it's truly awful. I wish that people didn't have to go through this. I wish that they could go to fucking college without being abused. Is that such a hard thing to ask for? Like, Next on our list is Liberty University, which is located in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, and this was started by Jerry Falwell, a massively influential and very evil fundamentalist. He founded the Moral Majority and he brought together the, at the time, scattered and multi-denominational religious right and mobilized them into the juggernaut voting block that they are today. He was besties with Ronald Reagan and he said and did all kinds of offensive shit and he did this so for several decades. He founded Liberty University in 1977, called something else at the time, and he basically invented the megachurch. He is a very, very interesting dude. Like I said, very evil, but very interesting. So check out my video on him. His son, Jerry Jr., is also an equally infamous scoundrel, and he has his own episode as well that talks more specifically about the ins and outs of Liberty University. It's got some good stuff in there, but I'll try to summarize some bits for you. Back in the olden times, there were things called segregation academies, and these were private Christian K through 12 schools that served the racist white people who did not want their kids going to integrated schools. And that really got the ball rolling for many of these schools that we're talking about today. Jerry Sr. was a huge fan of segregation um, until public opinion turned and he started losing money for being so racist. He has since apologized for his old views, but too little too late. Um, and yes, he is dead, so. I know, we don't have to worry about him anymore, but his son is still a menace. Jerry Falwell Jr. took over Liberty University, one of the largest evangelical schools in the world, over a decade ago, after his father's death. Now, he tells the Wall Street Journal that a group of self-righteous people are behind the push to remove him. Today, the university is saying it has accepted his resignation in the wake of multiple scandals. Reuters reported that the Falwells became entangled with Giancarlo Granda over eight years ago after meeting the then 20-year-old at a Miami hotel. In a statement, Falwell said his wife Becky had an affair with Granda, who later tried to extort them. Granda denies the accusation, telling Reuters that Jerry knew about the affair and would sometimes watch him and Becky together. Granda sharing phone conversations with Reuters, including this exchange from 2018. His new thing is like telling me every time he hooks up with people, like, <laughs> like I don't have feelings or something. You don't make it jealous, man. Yeah. Aww. All of this less than a month after Falwell posted and then deleted this photo on Instagram. Despite his defense that it was all in good fun, Liberty University put the 58-year-old on indefinite leave. In a statement Monday night, the school said additional matters came to light that made it clear that it would not be in the best interest of the university for him to return from leave. According to the university, Falwell responded by agreeing to resign immediately, but then instructed his attorneys not to send his resignation. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal late Monday, Falwell said he would indeed step down, acknowledging that some of his posts on social media had embarrassed the school. Tonight, Liberty University says its new leaders are committed to being good stewards, while also offering heartfelt prayers to the Falwell family. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. Liberty does have a football team, and Falwell Jr. once famously said that he, you know, wanted their football team to be a ministry tool, and he wanted uh, Liberty to be the Notre Dame of evangelical college football. Uh, I don't know if he achieved that goal. There is a huge racism problem at Liberty University. I mean, it was founded on racist values. Also, the atmosphere and the culture is very racist. And I would play you a clip from this Vice report about the racism, but mm, wouldn't you know they copyright claimed me. But to be fair, Big and Rich also copyright claimed me, and I'm not even mad about that. I love Save a Horse, Ride a Cowboy. And that song they did with Cowboy Troy. I like that one too. But in my head, Liberty University has always been known as the Fundy College to the Stars. 
Hey friends, I wanna to talk to y'all about Liberty University. So we and the Robertson family are very much Go Flames people because my brother went to Liberty, my sister-in-law, my brother is at Liberty right now, my sister's online. I took some classes from Liberty, so we love Liberty University. Um, like I said, I took some classes at Liberty University online and I loved it. It was very easy, especially for my lifestyle. I actually took Christian leadership and management classes because I love Christian leadership, but I also knew I needed a little bit more knowledge on the management side and business side of things. So you really can find whatever fits you and you can turn your passions into a career. They have more than 450 online degrees from associate to doctor level. Classes start every eight weeks, like I said. All courses are taught from a biblical perspective, which is really cool. So if you're looking to really grow your faith while you're in college, this is the perfect place for you to go. Um, they even have this like turf snow mountain and it's super, super cool that you can ski and uh, tube down. So it's just a great place to live and to go for college. As always, Kirk Cameron remains firmly in their ass. Steve Curry, that's right, Steph Curry's brother attended Liberty. Two-thirds of DC Talk attended Liberty. Lawson Bates' wife, Tiffany Espenson, is a graduate. Um, Terry Fader, uh, the other puppet guy, went to Liberty. And uh, Bethy's sister attended their online high school program. And I can't remember her name, but I'm sure it was the tall blonde one. Liberty has had all kinds of famous speakers at their convocation, which is a mandatory time that students have to attend um, to see speeches and they probably give announcements and do prayer. I don't care. At these convocations, they have all kinds of people. Yes, they did have Bernie one time, but everybody else has been some sort of hotshot um, political or religious figure um, in the conservative world. And yes, there is a significant LGBTQ plus presence at this school and although I am very proud of them for uh, speaking their truth I will say that I get the same kind of strange vibe that I do from progmos that's progressive Mormons on one hand I'm I'm just so happy that you're affirming but on the other hand damn is your shelf due to crack soon <laughs> And I'll be here when it does, okay? And last but certainly not least, we have Bob Jones University. I want to add that I love the name Bob Jones University, and it's funny to me for two reasons. Number one, it just sounds objectively fake. Yeah, I attend Jim Bob College. Like, who the fuck names a college? You don't put Bob in the name of a college and expect me to take it seriously. And number two... For a fundy college, they sure do have a hilariously euphemistic name. BJU? What's next? A degree in knuckleheadology from Limp Bizkit University? Bob Jones Sr., the one who started the college, has a downright villain origin story. Bob Jones Sr. was born the 11th of 12 children in 1883 to parents Georgia Creel Jones and William Alexander Jones, a poor farming family in rural Alabama. Tragically, little is known about his mother Georgia since documenting the lives of women was considered a loathsome inconvenience at the time. However, we do have evidence that his father was a Confederate veteran and a notably stern parent who terrified young Bob. He also preferred to go by his middle name, Alex, so Bob Jones Sr.'s father was a Confederate soldier with an anger problem named Alex Jones. Honestly, these jokes just write themselves. The family was also passionately religious. Bob himself was a traveling preacher and a political speaker by age 11 and the superintendent of his Sunday school by age 12, which was in addition to his traditional schooling and farm studies as well. Damn, I haven't seen child labor this egregious since I watched Lawson Bates pay for his dad's mortgage. In his early teens, Bob Sr. was sold off, shit, I mean boarded, to the family of Dr. Charles Jefferson Hammett, a Methodist missionary and scholar who operated Malleu, M-A-L-L-A-L-I-E-U, seminary school that Bob attended at the time. Bob lived with this family and worked in the home to pay off his school and boarding fees, even so far as to take orders from the family's biological children. So this dude was literally actually sold off. And then his parents died when he was 17. What the f- Did Lemony Snicket write this story? 
Bob would then pursue his formal education into seminary college before deciding to say fuck it and drop out and go solo on the back of his already strong reputation as a traveling preacher. His fame and fortune grew throughout the early 20th century thanks to his bombastic preaching style and ability to recruit particularly devoted converts. Moving into the Roaring Twenties, Jones found himself increasingly concerned with just how much the public school system was persecuting him and his fellow Christians with this newfangled evolution nonsense from that damn hippie Charles Darwin. Jones later recalled that in 1924, his friend William Jennings Bryan had leaned over to him at a Bible conference service in Winona Lake, Indiana, and said, if schools and colleges do not quit teaching evolution as a fact, we are going to become a nation of atheists. In the fall of 1925, shortly after the Scopes trial, Jones and his wife were driving in South Florida talking about the need for an Orthodox Christian college as an alternative to what he perceived to be the loss of both state and denominational colleges to secularism. After stopping for some sandwiches, Jones announced, just as a clap of thunder out of a clear sky, that he was going to found such a school. His wife's first response was, Robert, are you crazy? Jones immediately turned to the car north and began consulting with friends in Alabama and North Florida about a location. BJU wasn't just unaccredited upon its founding, it was founded on the principle of being unaccredited. Jones Sr. himself was well known for his stance against the practice of academic accreditation, citing concerns of possible atheistic slant in the opinions and approach of those on the certification board. The school was able to coast without accreditation for decades, even managing to get some students transferred into accredited schools. Notably, the school was aided by strong programs in art, speech, and music, which traditionally allowed for auditions or portfolios to take the place of test scores. BJU representatives also leaned on anecdotal evidence to support their lack of accreditation, making note of successful students from their school and lambasting unsuccessful students from other schools, while conveniently ignoring anything that even vaguely resembled a statistic. If you're not accredited, do they have a problem getting into postgraduate school? Sometimes they have a problem, but, uh, you know, people from accredited colleges do too. I'll give you an example. One of our graduates recently told me that uh, two years ago he went to the University of Virginia Medical School, and I said, how many were in your freshman class? He said, 127 of us. I said, how many applicants were there? He said, 4,700. Yeah. So he got in, but Harvard and Yale and Stanford graduates didn't, so there's no guarantee that accreditation will get you in. BJU would remain unaccredited from its founding in 1927 all the way until 2006, when it achieved member status with TRACS. This organization itself has a dubious history of enforcing soft academic requirements, remember. In 2017, the school finally achieved accreditation with the internationally recognized Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. The lack of accreditation also minimized the oversight of BJU's practices, policies, and treatment of students. This neglect, in turn, allowed for decades of abuse and prejudice to take place and go unpunished. Black students were notably banned outright from attending BJU until the 70s, long after the rest of the country had made significant moves towards academic integration. And even after their doors opened to black students, the school still banned interracial dating until the year 2000. Why can't black kids date white kids? Okay. Because you, you didn't take black kids for a long time, right? Well. 50% of American colleges, as late as the mid-1960s, still didn't take black students. But you were late. 1970. So we weren't that late. Furman University in our town took their first black, I believe it was in 65, Clemson in 63. So, you know, we were not exclusive in this and by any means. But do you, will you admit, as Jerry Falwell has said, you were wrong? You should have taken them. Yes, we, we do. We do, of course we do. Uh, why, why, explain this, why they can't date well, being a Bible-believing institution, Larry, we try to base things on Bible principle. The problem we have today is that our, our principle is so greatly misunderstood. People think we don't let them date because we're racist. No, to be racist, you have to treat people differently. We don't. We don't let them date because we were trying, as an example, to enforce something, a uh, principle that is much greater than this. We stand against the one world government, against the coming world of Antichrist, which is a one world system, a blending of all differences, a blending of national differences, economic differences, church differences, into a big one ecumenical world. Listen, man, I'm not racist. I just think race mixing is evil. That's what racism is. Also, waiting until the 70s to admit your first black student is 
not a flex, and it's also incredibly racist. We started this principle back in the mid-50s. I was a college student at BJU at the time, and it was with an Asian and Caucasian. Was, we didn't even have black students for another 15 years, so it was not put there as a black thing. I think so people so need to understand that. So the one world relates back to two people dating? Yeah. And believe it or not, it actually gets worse. We're not going to the Supreme Court fighting for our rule and our policy. We're fighting for our right to it. There's a religious freedom issue. That's all we, we are, ever thought. You're a private institution. You yeah. don't get the tax benefit because yeah. but you are entitled to the thing. I'm trying to find right. out why you have the yeah. rule. Okay, I get it. It's not about being racist. It's about you wanting the freedom to be racist. <laughs> At least he's got Bible verses to back this up, right? It wasn't the rule itself. We, 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 we can't point to a verse in the Bible that says you shouldn't date or marry in a You can't back it up. No, we can't back it up with a verse in the Bible. We never have tried to. We never have tried to do that. Like, why did you even do this interview? You are making shit so much worse. And sadly, racism is not the only major problem at Bob Jones University. Just like at PCC and many of these other colleges, students are afraid to report assaults because of the school's strict policies. Anything they do can and will be used against them. BJU administrators have allegedly ignored or punished students who bring up the issue of sexual assault. Victims of abuse have claimed that school administrators called them liars and sinners and told them not to report their attacks to the police because it would hurt Jesus. When I finally reported my assault to the school, the first questions they asked me were, what were you wearing? Was it tight? Was it low? Said Erin Birchwell, a BJU alumna who claims that she was assaulted more than 40 times over the course of two years by a male graduate student while she was an undergraduate. The assumption was obviously that it was my fault, that I had done something wrong by putting myself in that situation. BJU's leadership was determined to go the shittiest extra mile and make victim shaming a common and codified practice among its faculty and students. More than half of employees surveyed in 2014 reported that students' primary method of handling reports of sexual violence towards students was to dissuade legal action through mental manipulation and spiritual abuse. The school shockingly responded to this controversy pretty well by apologizing immediately and bringing in godly response to abuse in Christian education, or GRACE, which is an organization tasked with investigating and correcting the abusive culture that had pervaded at BJU for decades. Grace also investigates other schools and churches, too. They're a third-party um, group that comes in and does these things. After Grace investigated BJU and found, you know, all kinds of horrible shit, BJU said thanks for the investigation and then promptly did nothing to change anything at the school. So, isn't that lovely? The survivors and other people that worked so hard on this report even published a scathing letter calling for the school to act on their recommendation and change their own culture. Our purpose in writing this letter is to bring healing to the university culture. We need to move forward in a God-honoring manner. Countless victims have had their lives impacted for years, resulting in deep and ongoing sorrow, physical illness, relational impact, and spiritual questioning. How can you, as a spiritual leader, hide behind organizational platitudes and surface, quote, changes, and call this protecting your students and leading them to Christ? Is your loyalty to your constituents or the body of Christ as a whole? Will you become true leaders who face the truth even when it is uncomfortable? Leaders who recognize that your responsibility is relational, not just positional? Leaders who stand with the students who you are called to serve? Good evening. Glad you're with us tonight. Uh, former Bob Jones University students filed a lawsuit against that school. Furman University, a Furman football player, and a Furman police officer. The suit claims negligence during an assault investigation. 7 News reporter Ann Maxwell has our story. The Furman Police Department called SLED to investigate. Solicitor Walt Wilkins declined to press charges, saying there wasn't enough evidence for criminal charges. Now that former student, identified in the suit as Jane Rowe, is bringing a civil case and seeking damages. A get together at Furman University last October led to a call to campus police, a trip to the hospital, a sled investigation, punishment for drinking by Bob Jones University, and now a lawsuit. In the suit filed in Greenville County Thursday, a woman claims she was raped by a Furman football player, identified as John Doe. The suit says Doe, quote, negligently and recklessly engaged in sexual intercourse with the plaintiff when a reasonable person would have known the plaintiff was unable to consent. The suit names Doe, as well as Bob Jones University, Furman University, its police department, and Furman police officer Trevor Whitfield. The SLED report shows Officer Whitfield responded to the call about a possible assault on Furman's campus. The woman 
woman in question and a friend told officers they were afraid they would be expelled from the Christian University for drinking. The BJU handbook says, quote, students of any age who drink any alcoholic beverages, whether on or off campus, forfeit their privilege of enrollment as students. The suit says Officer Whitfield, as an alumnus of Bob Jones University, expressed disappointment in their behavior and notified the university because of his personal disapproval. The plaintiff accuses him of being motivated by reckless disregard for her rights, well-being, and safety. The suit also alleges Whitfield told the BJU students they could either go to the hospital or go to jail. They elected to go to the hospital and were taken to Greenville Memorial, where hours later, the suit alleges a Bob Jones official told the plaintiff she was being expelled for consuming alcohol. The suit says the university made that decision without investigating the allegations of drinking or holding any type of hearing. The plaintiff accuses all of the defendants of violating policies and procedures. A spokesperson from Bob Jones University says that student was actually suspended for the remainder of the year and has the option to reapply for the fall 2020 semester. He also said the university does not comment on pending litigation. In Greenville and Maxwell 7 News. So I guess long story short, um, all of these colleges are indeed very sketchy. And BJU is probably the worst of them because they were specifically given the tools to fix the problem and they said no. I understand why evangelicals want their own colleges. They want to have their cake and eat it too. They want their kids to get an education without all the liberal brainwashing. But the thing is, once you let your kids off the leash, they tend to form their own opinions and philosophies. They are not always going to return to you with the same terrible values that you instilled in them throughout childhood. Sometimes they do but a lot of times they don't. There's plenty of edgelord neocons that like to brag about surviving college without becoming a liberal, but that just means that they spent their free time doing keg stands instead of expanding their worldviews, maturing and growing as people. It's hard to bust your ass in school, work a full or part-time job, do extracurriculars, experience new cultures, and maybe also have your sexual awakening without having your world be changed. Many people are first radicalized when they go to college because this is the first time they've ever, you know, had real choices of consequence or, you know, just experienced life outside of their very sheltered upbringing. I mean, there's a reason why people change after they go to college and I just wish that conservatives would realize that it's mostly for the good. And I want to say that I have nothing against homeschooling. In fact, if Marshall could quit eating lotion, I would enroll him in a Montessori program. Yes, there are great homeschooling programs there are parents who do the most for their kids. There are kids who thrive in homeschooling. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons to do it. There are legitimate reasons and ways and ethical ways to do it, but we're not talking about that. I'm talking about a Becca type homeschooling programs here. I'm talking fucking Answers in Genesis, Ken Ham type homeschooling programs. Those are not the good ones. You know what I mean? The gist of it is it's really a shame that colleges like this are allowed to discriminate, are able to opt out of reporting sexual assault. It's really just a sad state of affairs, but um, yeah, I guess don't go to these colleges. And if you already have, be glad that you're done with it. Um, I hope you had fun watching this episode. Um, lots of serious, terrible things, but some jokes in there. Uh, you know, we like to have fun on this channel. I love you guys very, very much. Be sure to consensually smash that like and subscribe button. Follow me on Patreon. Um, we're doing monthly patron-only streams now, which has been really fun. Um, follow me on social media. Drink lots of water. Stay cool. Wear sunscreen. Be nice to people and um, be kind to yourself as well. I love you guys and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.